let me just um, introduce our next speaker, who some of you have met at prior Grants to States conferences. Lisa Frayhill is not uh, part of our Grants to States team, but she is a wonderful asset to our program. She's from our Office of Digital and Information Strategy and is our senior statistician there. So along with Matt Birnbaum, she's going to be presenting some data analysis from your wonderful state program report projects. So take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Terry. And I want to say that um, it's a real privilege to be able to work with the awesome folks in the Grants to States program and um, to share this data with you guys that you know, many of you spend many hours entering into the system. So um, I'm always very interested in hearing anything that you have to say or any questions that you might have on it. So um, we've done this. This is the fourth turn of the crank. And so basically the way we start is we give you a little bit of an overview of what the SPR framework is. And thank goodness the, the talk that Madison and Michelle just gave gave you a bit of an introduction to that already. So I can fly through those slides wicked fast. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the SLAA grouping, do a high-level summary. And then go into the description profile, which is basically, you know, what your basic journalistic type questions are. Who, what, when, how, why, and how much, right? So um, there's some uh, optional fields. So I'm going to try to make sure that we keep track of some of the caveats. OK. So one of the other things that we wanted to do was to give you a number of questions to be keeping in mind as I go through um, the, the slide deck. And then if you looked at it already, there's a lot of slides. There's a lot of data. So um, the idea is there's a whole bunch of trees in this forest. Please help me understand what the, or what the whole forest really needs to look at. So what are the stories? that are in these data that seem to really capture things best for you in your state or territory? Are there tools that would help us to make these data more useful to help you inform your outcomes? Um, what support do you need from us with data? And then something we haven't done, and I was hoping to do it this year, was to do a little bit more data linking in terms of we've, you know, the system has been set up to permit us to do some linking with the public library survey data, Common Core data, and IPED, which is the, um, the higher education survey data. So we haven't done that yet. We'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on that. So those are some questions you keep in mind as I race through the data slides. So the SPR, it has a number of very interesting analytical capabilities, which thrills me to no end, quite obviously. There's 14 intents, and these can be rolled up to six focal areas. But at the same time, we can take those intents and drill down into 38 different subjects. There's also, for no extra charge, three different levels of analysis. We can an analyze the data at the activity level, the project level, and then for states and territories. So the intents, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I think that this was covered a little bit in the previous talk. There's 14 intents. The user chooses an intent, right? And then those intents get rolled up to these six focal areas. And then the top three of these focal areas, which later in this presentation you'll see me refer to as the big three, um, really then align very closely with IMLS strategic goals for 2018 to 2022. And then there's what I sometimes call topical focal areas. Those relate to human services, employment, and economic development, and civic engagement. And then there's subjects. So as I said, each of the um, intent is also related to subjects. There's 37 subjects plus an other. And once the user enters an intent, they can also choose a couple of subjects. These come in extraordinarily handy. And um, my colleague, Matt Birnbaum, talk tomorrow will have um, done, used some analysis based on our analysis on these subjects, namely digital literacy and broadband adoption. In the past, we've done some um, work looking at summer reading programs, databases, 
and um, a little bit of work looking at some other topics as well. So when we look at the SLAA grouping, we then look using the general allotment level. Now, a few years back in 2017 and 2018, in the, the two, those two conference years, we had started saying, oh, well, let's do large and small by whether they do subgrants or um, you know, predominantly subgrants or predominantly SLAA awards. And what we heard from the states and territories was, you know something? Some of us do subgrants one year, and then you know, the next year we go to predominantly SLAA. So that's not a persistent quality. So we, we did have a sense that we wanted to kind of bin things and to start to understand if there were some interesting differences or some differences across these different groups. And so what we ended up with was, well, let's look at the allotment levels. And you can see that we have these three allotment levels, um, smaller, larger, and what we call mega, not to be confused with mega Godzilla. And so, you know, just <laughs> because those are so much larger than the larger. They really do differentiate. And you can see down below, I've got the 2018 population there. And on the 2018 population, you know, the, in the 28 states and the five territories outlying areas, um, they had a, a 2018 population of less than 5 million. Those that were in the larger, 5 to 13 million. And then these four megas, California, Florida, New York, and um, Texas, all had very large populations. The allotment sizes are quite a bit different. And then, as you can see, the average number of project activities for each project is a little bit different. They're about the same for the larger and the smaller states, but when you get into the mega states, they have a bit, you know, slightly more activities, another half of an activity per project than um, the others. So now, as I mentioned, this is going to be our description profile. I'm going to go into how much, why, who the partners are, how, you know, how the, what kinds of activities there are, the types of activities, um, where, and then um, a little bit about the subject code. So um, the optional fields are partners and locales. Not all, um, not all projects report those. Not all activities report those. And then, as I mentioned before, we're doing a focus this year on broadband and um, digital literacy. So this is what we tend to show as our sort of high-level overview. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I end up having graph after graph after graph, you know, showing a little bit more detail. But I'm going to point out just a couple of things, given I can remember how to how to point things out on here. Oh, this is it. So you know, you can see that the um, you know what we've seen is that. Over time, you know, FY14 was a pilot. FY13 was a pilot year, and then 14 everybody entered. But over time, the numbers of projects has gone down, and as well the number of activities. And that's really attributable to to a large extent to sort of learning, as people have learned how to really work with the system, how to enter it. You know, the excellent advice that Michelle and Madison gave you earlier, you know, those kinds of things, you know, people are gaining a, a knowledge base in that. About 70% of projects had about one or two activities. So this one you can't read on the screen, and don't even try, okay? I'm just, it's in the deck. You can then have access to the data, and the next couple of visualizations will show you some of the trends here. Um, one of the things, even though you can't see it, um, what we're seeing is that fewer projects are specifying more than one intent. And that's been a, a real big um, gain in terms of learning about how to use the system. So this is a chart that needs a little bit of explanation. And what you're going to see is that this dark bar is the LSTA fund's median project budget, and then the light bit on top is the other funds, but includes the, um, your state match, your, your in-kind match. This number up at the top represents the total median budget for the project for that fiscal year. And then this percentage down here, this shows you what percentage of that total budget is from LSTA funds, right? So there's a lot going on in this um, particular chart. And you can see that 
the, the big thing is that over, if we get this kind of interesting finding, and I'm, I'm obviously not quite sure why this is, but the, the states that were in the 19 large states that were kind of in the middle there, um, their projects tend to have lower budgets, and, at, and now in 2018, they have a proportionately higher spend on um, from LSTA funds, 68%, as compared to 62% for the megas and the 58% for um, the small states, right, the states with the smaller allotments, right. Um, the median project budget is higher in the small states. So it's, it's been kind of interesting. The percent um, overall, just to give you the benchmark here, about 68% is from LSTA, but 66% in um, 2018. So, um, so we get that kind of an interesting finding there. And I entertain whatever ideas people have about why this might be the case. The other way that we've looked at budgets, and um, our original thought on this back when we started doing this analysis was, well, maybe there's certain types of projects that we might be able to identify that states could do, quote, unquote, on a shoestring. So, hey, what are some projects that might be under, say, $25,000 or under $7,500, like some, some very inexpensive projects that, um, because the notion in the system, my understanding from, from the get-go was that this would provide a, a platform by which people could share information about projects. So we've been binning them by, um, by budget category, and as you can see, what we've got here is that you know, again, looking at the allotment size groups that consistent with the last chart, the, the um, large allotment size groups tend to have smaller budgets on their projects than do the other two. And that 49% of their projects have a total budget of less than $25,000. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, the, the activities. So up till now it was about project, now it's about the activities per project. And this is really where you see another big difference between the, the allotment size groups. And you sort of saw that in that last table where you really couldn't see the numbers anyway. But you can see them a little bit better here. And that is that for the, um, for the mega group, right, you can see that the um, that 57% have one or two projects, one or two activities per project, which is quite a bit less than you know the small and the large, and that one third of them have three to five, and that 10% of them have six or more, and that having six or more is really a characteristic of these very large states. You don't see it so much in the small states and in the large states. Okay. So we're done talking about the different, um, different size allotment groups and how that affects things. Now we're going to spend a lot more time digging into things like focal areas, activities, who, how things get done, things like that. So as I said before, what we've got is kind of two sets of focal areas that are the, you know, the six focal areas that roll up those 14 and 10. And you can see we've got the big three, information access, institutional capacity, and lifelong learning. And those tend to really dominate the numbers of projects that are there. Um, the big drop that we see is that in FY18 versus FY15, there's um, been a decline of by 19% in the number of information access projects. Um, kind of hard to see much in the trends down here in the, um, you know, the, the sort of topical categories, human services, civic engagement, and economic development. But what we see is that in FY8 is that they've not, because they're so small, they really have not changed in terms of relative size uh, very much over this time. Um, so now we say, OK, well, how many states or territories have projects in each of the focal areas. And as you can see, you know, um, almost everybody has something in institutional capacity. 
you know, nearly everybody has something in information access and lifelong learning in the big three. But then we see quite a few, you know, quite a bit fewer states who have projects in the topical areas in civic engagement, human services, and then economic development. And really, where we've seen the gain over the past um, couple of years is in civic engagement, and we've seen the decline in the numbers of projects in human services. Um, that said, what's kind of interesting is that the, the LSTA, but the median LSTA budget by those focal areas is very different. So, um, so if you recall, I said, well, human services, we've seen a decline in the number of projects, but we've actually seen that the LSTA budget for those is higher than that in civic engagement and economic development. And the highest LSTA spend is in the area of information access. Um, that, um, and that's where like a lot of database projects are going to pop up. Okay. So in this chart, um, this shows you, again, very similar to the last chart, although I didn't put the, the totals up at the top. Um, you can, again, get a sense of the relative budget of each of the different focal areas projects, right? And these are the big three. The um, so these here, right? These here are the big three: information access, institutional capacity, and lifelong learning. But you can see that they vary greatly in terms of the magnitude of their budget, their total budget. Just like the other chart, the dark part shows you the LSTA funds, and the light part shows you the non-LSTA funds. And then this percent gives you what percentage of the total budget is from LSTA. And so even though these are more expensive, they use proportionately less LSTA funds than the lifelong learnings, uh, learning projects. The same thing um, we see uh, in human services, where about half of the budget is, in, uh, is from LSTA funds but they're much more expensive projects than are the projects in civic engagement and economic development. Economic development is the, are the projects that have the highest percentage of budget from LSTA funds. OK, so we've been talking about projects. Now we're drilling one step down into the activities. And if you recall, for, the, for many states, 70% of the projects project have one or two activities. It's just a handful that have more than that. So when we talk about activities, we can say, well, what types of activities? And there's four types of activities in the SPR. There's content, instruction, planning and evaluation, and procurement. And this is, quite literally, how they stack up. And the, the most you know, common thing that you see here, the most prevalent thing, is the fact that the relative mix has not really changed markedly over the past four years in terms of what kinds of, you know, projects or what kinds of activities are, um, are engaged in. The one big difference that we do see is that in um, FY16, a little bit more slightly higher percentage and larger number of um, activities were related to evaluation. And that, of course, is when the five-year evaluations, the, the evaluations for the five-year FY, you know, 17 year-end um, projects were, were coming due. So why? So now we can do those same stacks, right, so the types of activities by focal area for the activities. And so, again, we've got the big three, and you can see some real dramatic differences in terms of how, they're at, how they allocate across the different types of activities. That institutional capacity has a lot more to do with content or with instruction, right, and that information access has to do with content, getting more information. That's where those databases are showing up. And that lifelong learning has quite a lot to do with instruction, right? And then here, too, you can see that light blue for um, instruction is prevalent in the topical areas as well. 
So now, um, if we drill into, you know, say just look at the FY18 data, and you know, these are another way to look at those stacks. And hopefully, your eyes are not glazing over yet. Um, this is it's kind of interesting because this gives you a sense of just how different the focal areas are in terms of the types of activities that end up you know, sort of rolling out. And here I've included the procurement, which procurement is only allowed under institutional capacity. Um, but you can see that it accounts for about 10% of the institutional capacity projects. Okay. Um, and those are the big three. If we look at the smaller ones, civic engagement, human services, and economic development, we can see that, again, they're overwhelmingly um, instruction, but the, you can see quite a lot of content associated with the economic development. So activity locales. Is the, they're in the system and asks, is this a statewide or not a statewide project or activity? And um, yeah, so uh, what we've seen over time is that the relative percentage of statewide projects has increased, right? Even though, as we see, the numbers of activities that are in the system have actually decreased. So now about 40, as you can see, 47% of the activities in the STR are statewide. So locales are one of the optional items. And so um, this shows you, you know, what types of locales, um, the, where, the, where the activities are implemented. And you can see the public libraries lead the way in terms of the 42% of FY18 activities had as at least one of its locales, a public library. And I must note that this is, 42% um, of those that specify locales, the, um, they could specify more than one public library. So this isn't the whole total number of public libraries. This is the number of activities that have specified that a public library was one of its locales. Um, we've seen a big increase in terms of the percentage that have specified the SLAA as a locale. And that's not a surprise, given this previous chart that was showing that there was more statewide activity, and the SLAA becomes one of the important locations for that. And then the proportion of activities at an academic, a school, or a special library has increased by about three percentage points um, between FY15 and FY18. So partner areas. Um, the partner areas are also are an optional item. Um, about 56% of the activities in FY18 reported them. Um, that's a little bit higher percentage than reported them in FY15. In FY15, just 52% of the activities had um, a partner area that was reported for it. Um, and you can see that local state um, governments tend to um, be predominant when a partner area is specified. Um, Nonprofits um, have stayed fairly constant. I know it's hard to tell because the, you know, the, the bars are showing you the numbers of activities, and then the percentages are showing you what percent of the activities that specified it. And as another little point here, like the other chart, an activity can specify more than one partner area. And then partner types. So, um, out of the, so not all of them who specified a partner area specified a partner type. Um, just 38% specified a partner type. But when they did, they overwhelmingly specified libraries as a partner type. And then a very small percentage did specify museums, cultural heritage organizations, and historical societies as partners. Um, Hi, Lisa. This is Lisa. Hi, this is Deidre. Yep. A question popped up. Um, the question is, would tribal libraries be considered other in most states? Um, actually, that's a, that is a very good question. I would probably want to see what um, folks would have said in a um, you know in the state because over he, it, 
in a sense, you'd have to cross the partner area, which is on this chart, right? Because you can have a partner area as a Native American, uh, American Indian, Native Hawaiian organization with the partner type. And that, I think that that could tell you whether it's a tribal library. So that's a really good question, and that sounds like something that I could have, you know, about 20 minutes of fun with sometime. So I hope somebody writes that one down so I don't forget it. So thank you. That, that's a really good one. Um, you know, because some, sometimes you could have the same thing, like cultural heritage organizations. Could be tribal organizations as well. Okay. So who? So who are the beneficiaries of the activity? And you can have the public. And within public, they could be general or targeted. You know, is there a specific, um, like, group that is the focus? And then, um, you know, the library, I say library workforce, but really this is library more generally. And you'll see that in a moment when I get to um, the next slide. And so um, what we see is that over time there's only been a slight decrease in the percentage of the activities that are for targeted public audiences and a slight increase in the relative proportion of activities that are focused on the library as an audience. Uh, Alicia, I'm, I'm sorry, just a, one quick question. Someone wants to know what actually defines other. That is a very good question. I was <laughs> actually in the SPR book earlier today trying to track that down myself. So um, I will ask if Matt has some pearls of wisdom on that one. Matt, I don't have can you? Yeah, I hear you. I don't have the SPR in front of me, but I'm 90% certain it's under. It's a type of content activity. It's a mode under content. OK. But I mean, this. I think you're, is the question you're asking about this chart, though, where it's like active or the partner types as other. So actually, I think people can fill yeah, in other big, 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 big. Yeah. For this, this would be yeah. a partner that was not one of the other categories. Yeah, I saw some other um, things listed as I was looking at the verbal entries there. And um, I could make a list, but it, it is a variety of things that don't fit any of these categories. I'll, um, if I, I'll see if I can circle back with you, Joy, on that. So when I, a moment ago I mentioned that like it's really not just the library workforce, but library in general. And in terms of, if you look at the activities, about 40% in FY18 focus on the library. And of these, that you can, we break this down by the focal areas. And then within the institutional capacity focal area, which is where the, most of them are, almost two thirds, we further drill down into the intent. So this is one of the only places within my presentation where I drill down to the intent at all. And you can see that when we look at the, the um, 1,182 activities that were focused on the library, about 60, 69% of the 63% were specific to the library workforce, but that quite a number of them really relate to improving library operations, accessing information, lifelong learning, you know, the topical areas. So it's important to bear in mind is that the, you know, the key, some of these activities have a lot to do with providing the support to library staff to be able to implement programming for related to topics or to provide access for, um, for patrons to lifelong learning or other information sources. So if we look at the types of library workforce activities, um, most, you know, 
almost two-thirds of the ones that are in instruction has to do with institutional capacity. And you know, in this case, the all others includes the other focal areas, namely lifelong learning and the three topical areas. So you can kind of see the breakdown here of how the you know, institutional capacity continues to be an important um, focal area. And the instruction is one of the primary ways in which the activities are implemented. Um, so when we look at public activities, so now the public activities account for about 60% of the activities that are reported in the STR. And as I mentioned earlier, the relative percentage of those that were for targeted groups has declined slightly, and those for general groups has increased. But what we can see is that the the way in which they are distributed across the different focal areas really varies. So that 65% of the lifelong learning activities for the general public are targeted at a specific group. And that's much higher than, say, the institutional capacity or the information access ones. And I see a question. Um, what is it? Oh, the difference between content and procurement. So, um, so content. There's a number of ways in which content actually it happens. It's so procurement is actually purchasing things, whereas content could be like digitizing things. It could be acquiring um, like curriculum materials or things like that. Um, so I think that. There's a, there's a very subtle difference there. Procurement is only for institutional capacity. So if you obtain content that is used for a program um, for the public and it's for something other than institutional capacity, it gets lumped into the content category as an acquisition. So, so if we go back, you know, 60% are public activities. And what we have is, OK, so among those, 817 of them are targeted, right? So 817 represent 28% of all activities. 47% of the activities for the public are targeted. What types of targets are, are the focus of these? And age groups is really the number one thing. Um, 37, and what this is telling you is that 37% of the 1,754 public activities are targeted at some particular um, age group. Okay? So, um, and that's more than one third of them. Then, if you look down, you can see that the, the targeted, like, Activities that are targeted at, say, immigrant groups or specific ethnic groups are relatively small in terms of the numbers. Um, so if we drill into the age groups that are targeted by public activities, what we see is that the, um, you know, the, the, zero to, the youngest age group, zero to five preschool age group, is the largest um, it has actually had the biggest change since um, FY15. We've seen an expansion there in terms of the percentage of um, activities that target um, early, liter early learners, right? Um, but you can see that the general distribution is about the same in FY18 versus FY15. And then if we look at ethnic groups that are targeted by public activities, what we see is that um, Hispanics tend, you know, are the largest group that is targeted. But the, over, over, the t over time, what we've seen is proportionately fewer activities are targeted at various ethnic groups. But again, the distribution is about the same in both, of the, both FY15 and FY18. So I'm going to pause there real quick because I've been seeing some of the questions that come up, and I'm not sure if um, I've got the 
got them all answered. Um, Actually, Terry, there's, there's one. Yeah, Terry, exactly. Yeah. So Terry, uh, Ter Terry wants to know: uh, Didn't the SDR change in 2016? Was this included in the assessment of the number of projects, et cetera? Um, so that's that's a good question because I'm not certain. Matt, what what material what material change for FY16 would there have been that Terry is referencing here? Yeah, sure. That's easy. The uh, the uh, 2014, we started piloting the new SPR with about 15 states, and 2016, all the states joined the new system. So, so he's talking. So, what you were talking about, Terry, was the year 2016 rather than the reporting of the SPR reporting year. I believe okay. all the states began to report in FY16. Well, I think, well, they all reported their FY15 data. It's just that they would have done that in 2016, right? Keeping our, like, FYs and calendar years, reporting years, squared away. Okay. Any other questions before I, like, jump into outputs? Because this is the fun thing that I messed with this year that's a little different. Okay. I do not see any additional questions. Okay. Just, I just thought I, I'm looking at the Q&A right now and trying to keep track of that. The thing I can't see is the clock, so I'm sorry. I just can't see the green thing right now. Um, uh, so I'm just going to leap on forward into activity output. So there's about 40-some-odd different outputs that are available in the SPR, and these outputs those of you who have reported them, you you see how this rolls out, right, in terms of, okay, so once you've indicated the activity and said what type it is, what the mode was, what the format was, all of that kind of stuff, then you have a block where you enter the activities. And in fact, in Madison and in Michelle's presentation, they had a screenshot that, that showed you that, which, um, I think would be really helpful right about now as a visual. But, but there's so what that ends up what ends up happening then is that you have forty some odd activities and or activity outputs. So to start doing a little bit of analysis on those outputs that goes beyond just saying how many of different things came out of this which is what we kind of did for two years, for F in um, 2017 and 2018. This year, I drilled into two types of outputs that seemed like you could sort of well-define them. Program evaluations, and you know, part of the reason there is that that's something that's really important to do in all of the projects and um, all the activities, and then databases. And the reason is that Databases come up all the time, and in fact, Jamie Bell, I know you're on, um, has put a bug in my ear that it would be really great to, to do what we can to get a handle on, on how much all the databases cost. So what I, um, what I did was program evaluations, like I said, it's fairly well defined. Those outputs are all very well connected to a program evaluation activity. Databases, on the other hand, I had to do some limiting. So I'm not looking at all the databases that got reported as outputs. I'm only looking at the databases where it was an activity where only databases were acquired and that this was only one activity. So that way we're just saying, okay, we're going to really limit ourselves. And then the metrics that um, we assembled were how many states reported this, how many activities, and then how, much, how many of them did we get, how many evaluations, how many databases. What were the costs, the total in the LSTA budgets? And then we've got sort of what did each thing cost that we you now that we got, right? So, um, so this is the first time of doing this kind of analysis. And so um, no visualizations, just two tables of numbers. And um, you know, the data are not ingested for inflation as any of the other you know, financial data. 
And basically, I just wanted to kind of point out a couple of things, and that is that, you know, evaluations were reported by, you know, 30 to 38 states over the period 2015 to 2018. A number more in 2016, obviously, as the, you know, the five-year plans were being evaluated. And there were more activities, obviously, in 2016. So 2016, we're going to see kind of a, you know, a hotbed of evaluation activity going on, right? And so, you know, so then we can look at the total number of evaluations, right? So this is the number of evaluations that were, you know, you know, reported as having uh, been completed in that year, right? And then this is the total cost total budget, the LSTA budget, and then this cost for completed evaluation just takes these numbers in their raw form, not in these rounded numbers that I've presented here, and divides by the, the number of evaluations and comes up with how much each one cost, right? So you can see this kind of trend where the total cost per completed evaluation went from 7200 up to $21,000. But then the median budget per evaluation has actually gone up quite a bit. It's doubled. And that's not a surprise. As um, institutions start out with doing evaluation, it takes a little time for that um, business practice to take hold. And it takes a little time for evaluations to start to realize just how much a good evaluation is going to cost them. And by good, I mean one that they'll be able to actually use and, and be able to um, make some hay with. So, you know, so what we're seeing though is a kind of interesting trend too where the overall the percentage of the evaluation that was covered by the LSTA budget has gone from nearly half down to less than one fourth of the evaluation. So that means that the states are investing in the evaluations themselves. So that's the evaluations a little outputs analysis on that. And then the databases, which again, this had to be limited to just only the outputs, all of the, the databases that were acquired based on the number, these are only, act, the pro, only activities for which it was a one activity project, the only activity was the data, you know, related to the databases, and so it was, you know, so we can sort of do a one-to-one -one matching here. And so here you can see that um, databases are, are not cheap, as you guys all well know. <laughs> um, they're, they're quite expensive and that they've, you know, really fluctuated, you know, the per unit cost has, has really changed a bit over time. Um, but whereas the percentage of, um, you know, costs borne by LSTA funds on the evaluations has declined. Um, it's been failed, it's kind of fluctuated a bit here for um, for the databases. So that's the first crack at some outputs analysis, um, um, just looking at databases and uh, and evaluations. Are there any questions about that or any comments? This is the first time we've presented these analyses. To you folks. We don't have any have any immediate uh, questions right now, Lisa. Okay, I just thought I'd give people a chance. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to see that, that folks are, are appreciating that. I see like a couple of folks saying interesting and thank you. And uh, it's, it's good to know my efforts are appreciated. Thank you, guys. So this is actually our second look at activity outcomes. And this, we did the first one last year. Um, this is a very, uh, ooh, that, that's cool. Somebody, oh, I'm going to mention yeah. this before I jump <laughs> into this. Uh, Mara Wall says, it would be interesting to see database cost per use. Yeah, that would be fun. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that, uh, if you have ideas about how I might be able to uh, measure that, please let me know. Um, that would, I think that, that inquiring minds, I think, would, would like to know that answer. 
Okay, uh, so I'm going to jump into the outcomes now. This is that um, that questionnaires, and I think it was Michelle and Madison's presentation talked about it. Um, these outcomes questionnaires are aligned with project outcome, and the idea was that this way they it wouldn't at least in theory, present a huge burden on libraries to collect it, because if they were already participating in project outcome, they would be collecting these data. But there's only four instances where we have you know, instructional activities for either the general public or the, work, or the library workforce, or we have content or planning and evaluation for the library workforce. So there's only four types of things where we collect this. And um, you saw this in the previous talk, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you can see is it's this set, you enter in, you know, the, the, um, the survey findings, right, and this is, so that's, you know, so that was the, the look at what the survey looks like, and then this is what you enter in for the questionnaire. When you pull these data, there's 108 variables across the four survey types. The analysis that I end up doing means that um, there's a few caveats. So number one, um, sometimes the survey didn't really align with the type of activity. So that in those cases, I dropped that data because I thought there's something, you know, I'm going to use a technical term here, funky going on, and we don't want to include that data. The second thing is um, that there were uh, some activities for which fewer than 10 responses were reported. And so I dropped those from the analysis as well, because we know that those are going to potentially be problematic. And this is actually kind of the second path. Um, we did, uh, this year, we did a little drilling into um, some of the intents with the library workforce. And um, the other thing that we could be spending some time doing is looking at formats. So for example, um, the programs can be administered as either a virtual and in-person or a combination of virtual and in-person. And so um, we have an opportunity here to be able to look at you know, whether there might be some interesting differences in how, the, how those different formats are assessed by different audiences. Um, but that's, that's uh, sitting on the back burner at the, at the present moment. So the way that we do this is all of these scales that you saw here are what are called Likert scales, right? They're five-point Likert scales. Strongly disagree, disagree. People sitting right on the fence in the middle and either agree or disagree, agree and strongly agree, right? And so those five-point scales, you can think of it as having, there's a strength of agreement, end of the scale, and a strength of disagreement. And I'm going to go ahead and click through and get some more stuff up here. Okay. So you can kind of see the scale here. And you've got the neutral ones. These are the people who said neither agree or disagree. We put half of them on one side of the fence and half on the other side of the fence. And then we have agree and strongly agree. And we have disagree and strongly disagree. And we leave the non-respondents in, okay? and I'm going to show you why it is we leave the non-respondents in in just a moment. So, so mathematically, this is how we represent the Likert scale. These are the five questions that they're asked, and these are for the general public activity outcomes. There were 53,661 responses from 240 activities. So what we tend to see happen in such instances is what is referred to as regression to the mean, which means that there's a very high level of agreement, strong agreement on, um, on the items. Right. Now, why is it that we put the non-respondents over here? Um, there's, so what tends to happen in surveys of this type is a um, social psychological thing called satisficing, namely that people tend to not want to say something negative. And so if they don't, and it sort of follows that old thing, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. And that's what non-response is. 
That's saying nothing at all. However, in the particular case of this question, that you know, I am more aware of resources and services provided by the library, um, non-response is actually also kind of a signal that within the context of a Likert scale, it can be kind of confusing for respondents. So around 30% of people did not respond to this item at all to it in, in terms of, um, you know, like, well, I sort of knew about this ahead of time, but now I can't say I didn't learn more because, well, that's saying something negative, and I really like the project. So they have this sort of, you know, um, difficult time really processing that, that they don't want to say something negative, and to say something, but to say something negative isn't necessarily negative, if that makes any sense at all. So if we look at the library workforce, we had so many responses here on different types of activities that um, I was able to say, OK, well, let me look at just in-person programs. And we've got 8,200 responses for 73 activities. And this is specifically for um, instructional programs that were focused on improving the library workforce. And you can see that, again, there's a very high level of agreement here but that it varies in terms of, yeah, they learn something, but they're less likely to, to have the same strength of agreement that, that it will improve services for the general public, but they still overwhelmingly say this. So more than 80% of people said something positive on all of these four questions. Hi, Lisa. David wants to know when you get a low response rate to a specific question over time, would it be the time to reevaluate that particular question? You betcha. <laughs> that would be, yeah. But, and, and I think last year was our first year, David. Um, you know, we talked through these at the LSTA coordinators meeting. And that, you know, that last one that I was talking about, about the, um, the non response, um, there were a lot of options that people said, hey, well, they could say not, they could not respond because of this or whatever. So, um, yeah, it does signal that you need to kind of go back into the question. I think um, what's interesting about these questions, too, is that they're the Likert scale items, and those are the only ones that get reported in the STR. But then there's some open-ended questions, and I think that those are probably potentially more useful on the ground at, you know, at the point where a program or activity is being actually implemented. You know, so and, and also those open-ended questions can often suggest ideas for other sort of closed-ended questions that one might wish to ask at a future time. So, um, but that's a that's a really great question, and I don't know what the what the timeline is for this. I do know that because this is aligned with project outcome, that um, that there's a larger context in which this um, exists. And then, do we have a process in place to make changes? Um, I'm going to go back to my colleague Matt on this. Do we have a process of that sort, Matt? Not sure Matt is. Uh, Lisa, I'm sorry, can you, I'm, I'm just trying to digest the question. Do we have no, a process like, in place? I, 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 think, I, I don't think so. It's, it's a hard, so it, well, let me give a more complete answer as to why it's not so simple. So the, the questions that we have around the surveys, these are aligned to those in project outcome that are run by the Public Library Association, and that was systematic so that libraries who are either participating in project outcome or are who are receiving a grant to the state's grant, they wouldn't have to ask two sets of questions to the same grantees. So there was lots of thought and care to making sure that the questions that are in the STR matches those to project outcome. We have not talked with PLA about what would that process be like for revisiting the questions, but it's certainly a, uh, a fair one to be considering in the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Sure. And it's a lot of moving parts to this 
particular one, I think. So now, um, so I also set this up for instructional programs, so um, for library operations. I'm just going to kind of click through these. You know, um, these are the kinds of programs where the library, it's for the library workforce, but the intent was to improve users, fill in the blank. So these are those, those activities where they're doing an instructional program with the library workforce, and the intent is so that the library workforce can then do something that will help their, um, their patrons. And what's interesting is that this is a very, very strong level of agreement that the library workforce folks did learn something. And in fact, that, that they really felt strongly that this was going to help them um, improve services for the public. And notice how the levels of non-response on these are really quite a bit smaller than on some of the other um, questionnaires that we saw. So this is, you know, this is an example of where we've taken the data and we've sliced it a couple of different ways to really get at, you know, more specific instances, more specific types of programming that have been implemented. And this is that content acquisition and creation. And um, so these are uh, the only the library workforce gets asked these. They're, small number of responses compared to the others, and then, you know, number of activities. And you can, again, see that the non-response is pretty small, relatively speaking, and that fairly high level of agreement on it, but there's only two questions on this. And then this is the last um, type of uh, type of questionnaire there is, and that is ask the library workforce about the planning and evaluation activities. And as you can see, it's only 12 activities that have 303 responses. So it is a very, very small number. And but you see, it's kind of kind of interesting because here this is the one item on which there's actually a bit more disagreement than on the others. Right. On all the others, you saw these tiny little orange and red yellow bars on this side of the zero. And here, um, about evalu planning and evaluation, um, there, there you see a, a higher level of disagreement with, um, with the statements. Um, so on the one hand, they felt, as you can see, you, know, you still have a very high level of agreement that at some level it addresses the library needs but they're not satisfied, they're not as highly satisfied with the extent to which the planning and evaluation activity addresses the library needs. And then, and then this last item is whether I believe the information from the planning and evaluation will be applied to address library needs. And you can see it's a little bit going on with all three of these questions together. So it's, so it really is the case you get a, in, you know, based on my sort of gut feel for what what we're seeing with these questions is it's really important to um, to slice them, you know, to to try to control as much as possible for the intent. You know, this one is a much tighter controlled set of um, activities, planning and evaluation, right, versus you know, these others in these other charts, right, where we're looking at instructional programs, um, you know, this is, this is a real mixed bag of activities, right? This is everything from, you know, a citizenship thing to, like, a healthy diet thing to a yoga class, you know, all kinds of things, right? Okay, so I do see the yellow thing, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'm going to go back to the questions that I started with. Um, I, I apologize for not really keeping, keeping track of your questions as well as I could have. But I guess I throw this back at you and say, you know, are there things in here um, that you'd like us to be spending more time calling attention to? Are there things that we could do to, you know, best provide these data for you uh, to support your project?
And um, I'll leave it at that. And thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Lisa. This is Terry. We'll um, getting right to the break time now. So if you have comments or questions, uh, Lisa put her information on the last slide here. I'll just advance it there, alfrejo at imls.gov.